I'm Tom Heckert. I'm the director of the Bureau of Medical Review. Um, we are the people uh, in the Department of Health at OHIP that do all the prior approval for PDN um, and, of course, for durable medical equipment and some other services, as well as claims, pendant claims, um, and claims processing for special, uh, uh, special um, situations. Uh, but today, um, we are here to talk about private duty nursing and our new initiative, uh, Investing in Medically Fragile Children, um, to give you information um, that you need um, about our private duty nursing fee enhancement and our new provider directory. Um, today, presenting for us, we have Beth Dennison, who is our prior approval manager, and Melissa Klein, who is the uh, supervisor of the prior approval unit for private duty nursing. Some of you may have already talked to Melissa in the course of normal um, business in, in your prior approval. We also have a special guest star today, um, Joanne Dion from uh, the provider enrollment will be talking to you during one slide about um, some of the um, uh, ways to make sure uh, your uh, application for the directory can be processed faster. Just some tips um, uh, from things that we've seen. We did do a webinar uh, last Tuesday um, 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 for Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, time flies so much um, for providers. So some of this information has been out in, in the community. Uh, I'm sure some of your fellow nurses may have uh, given uh, given you um, some information. I also see there are um, uh, uh, questions coming in already. Um, again, we will be posting some of these questions um, relate to posting of the slides or handouts. Um, we will be posting these um, at the end of the um, seminars um, onto the PDN um, listserv. Um, uh, and uh, well, the noting in the PDN listserv that they're posted on the PDN provider communications. So you can go and find them there. Uh, I, I usually say this during the Q&A, but I do encourage everybody to uh, uh, to um, subscribe to the PDN listserv through eMedMe so you're notified of changes in, in the program. So the, today we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about a new, the new fee enhancements for PDN, uh, our new PDN directory. Um, try to give you some why you should, should participate in the directory, the benefits of, of, of the new program, and we're also going to show you how to enroll in the new PDN um, Medically Fragile Children's Directory. Uh, so with that, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Beth Dennison, who's going to, to start to talk to you about uh, the uh, design project and um, uh, some of the things uh, that are exciting um, being done in the private duty nursing area. Thank you, Tom. The first thing that I'd like to review with everyone is uh, the changes that have been made to private duty nursing and the medically fragile children population. In 2020, uh, due to Medicaid redesign team uh, recommendations, there was legislati legislative amendment made to Title 18, uh, Section 505.8, which affects uh, medically fragile children and the private duty nursing um, benefit. The changes are bulleted here. Um, they will be effective October 1st, 2020. Um, the first is to increase the PDN fees for medically fragile children enrolled in fee-for-service Medicaid. The second is the creation of a private duty nursing directory for medically fragile children. And the third is to uh, move the responsibility for setting the PDN fees from the counties to the Department of Health. Um, the fee enhancements, um, what essentially uh, was done is because the department is now going to determine the fees, uh, we created uh, regional fees as opposed to the county fees. There is an upstate and a downstate region that were created. 30% um, medical fragile training and experience enhancement that has been in place and has been available for providers um, since 2007. Um, the age is extended now for members up to the age of 23. 
it currently is 21, but as of October 1st, it will be going to 23. And also the new directory participants will receive a 45% increase over three years to PDN fees for members up to 23 years of age. Um, the Medically Fragile Children's PDN program is actually composed of two components, the Training and Experience Enhancement and the PDN Provider Directory. Um, as I just discussed, the enhancement for training and experience has been available since 2007, and the PDN Provider Directory is new for October 1st. Providers can choose to enroll in one or both of the components. Re-enrollment into each program component is required during the routine provider enrollment revalidation process, which occurs every five years. Eligible providers for this program are the Licensed Home Care Services Agency, and also the independently enrolled nurse providers, RNs and LPNs. Next, Melissa Klein is going to um, go into a little more detail regarding the private duty nursing provider directory. Okay, thank you, Beth. So the private duty nursing directory, which is the new component of the Medically Fragile Children's Private Duty Nursing Program, will be listing private duty nurses and nurse agencies that serve the Medicaid population up to the age of 23 who receive fee-for-service private duty nursing services. The directory will be searchable by name, licensure, city, and county. The directory will identify providers who are also enrolled in the Medically Fragile Children Training and Experience portion. The directory will be available to the public and it will be updated on a weekly basis. And we want to stress here that private duty nurses and agencies must enroll in the directory in order to receive the directory fee enhancement. Private duty nurses' participation in the directory indicates the willingness to accept inquiries for providing care to medically fragile children. So providers who enroll in the directory should expect to receive inquiries from members, family members, or representatives, discharge planners, and case managers. Directory participants are expected to respond to all inquiries received. The enhanced fees will be applied to private duty nursing cases for dates of service 10-1-2020 and after. And again, we just want to stress that active participation in the directory is required for that directory enhanced reimbursement. And providers who do enroll in the directory must respond to all inquiries received through directory participation. Being listed in the directory does not guarantee employment. So here we have a snapshot of the Medically Fragile Children's Online PDN directory, which will be available at the website located here at the bottom of the screen. Um, this is where providers and uh, family members, private duty nursing community will go to access that directory, as well as a, a host of other uh, informative information. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Beth at this part of the presentation, and she's going to talk about some benefits of participation in the program. Um, the PDN MFC program fee enhancements. The fee enhancements are applied for each component of the program. The Medically Fragile Children Training and Experience is already available and an option for providers. The nurse or agency enrolls in the program by attesting to medically fragile children training and or experience. That portion is not changing and will remain as is, except the age of the child has been increased to 23. <clears throat> the 30% fee enhancement will be calculated at claim submission. The second portion is the PDN Medically Fragile Children's MFC Provider Directory that Melissa was just describing. These fee enhancement percentages will be applied to the regional base fees and are going to be um, applied in the following schedule. October 1, 2020, it will be a 15% additional enhancement. April 1, 2021, it will increase to 30%. And April 1 of 2022, it will increase to 45%. 
If a provider is eligible for both enhancement, enhancements, there's a stacked payment upon claims processing. With the current training and experience enhancement applied first, and then the directory enhancement applied after. Um, the base fees that uh, the 30% enhancement come from are the new regions that will be established for October 1, 2020. Uh, there will be two regions, downstate and upstate. Uh, downstate will include the counties of Bronx, Dutchess, Kings, Nassau, New York, Orange, Putnam, Queens, Richmond, Rockland, Suffolk, Sullivan, Ulster, and Westchester. And then you obviously the re remaining counties in New York will be the upstate region. There is one um, small exception. The current Ontario county cases will be grandfathered to continue at their current fee. New cases in that county will have the upstate fee applied. We had hoped to have the fees available for this presentation, but unfortunately, they are still in the budgetary review process. And as soon as they are become available to us, they will be published via a PDN listserv, which uh, Tom had mentioned we encourage people to sign up for and also on the eMedney website. This is just a breakdown of visual so you can see how the counties are divided between upstate and downstate. Um, and now Melissa is going to um, go through how the current prior approvals are going to convert to the new regional fees. So with the um, with two regional, the new regional fees being implemented, we do have to make um, some changes to prior approvals that have already been processed. So all prior approvals that are approved with a date span of service as of October 1st, 2020, will be approved with the new regional fees. Prior approvals approved in September 2020 with the date span of service that includes dates of service before October 1st of 2020 and as of October 1st, 2020, we'll have two prior approval numbers. The one prior approval will be for dates of service before September 30th. Those will be at the current county fees. And one prior approval for dates of service as of October 1st, and those will be at the new regional fees. Prior approvals that have been approved prior to the new regional fee effective date will be end dated September 30th, 2020. The Department of Health will issue a new prior approval based on regional fees for approved hours. A new prior approval letter will be sent to the provider and member for use as of October 1st of 2020. It will be important that providers put the appropriate prior approval number on their claim based on the date of service to be reimbursed the appropriate fee. We're just going to go over claim submissions as of October 1st of 2020. Claims processing enhancements for the directory will not be implemented until October 22nd of 2020. Claims submitted prior to October 22nd will not process with the directory enhancement. That leaves two options for billing providers. The first option is providers may choose to hold all claim submissions for dates of service after October 1st and submit after October 22nd. This option will ensure proper processing with the directory enhancement. The second option is for providers to continue to submit their claims, and they will be reimbursed without the directory enhancement. If this option is chosen, the department will reprocess the claims at a later date to pay correctly. And again, just to stress here that claims submitted after October 22nd will process and pay with the directory enhancement without any intervention. We're now going to take a look at the provider enrollment process. And I am going to turn it over to Tom at this point, and we are going to go to the, oh, I'm sorry, before we do that, I'll just tell you where you can find those, those forms. They are available on the emedney.org website in the provider enrollment section. We did begin accepting these forms on September 9th of 2020. The forms are provider type specific, so agency providers would follow the nurse registry instructions form and independent providers would follow the nurse 
LPN RN instructions form. Providers may participate in one or both components of the program, and it is important that those forms are signed and dated appropriately. Okay, here we have um, the three ways that those forms can be submitted. They can be submitted via email at provider enrollment at health.ny.gov. What's important to note here is if you're submitting by email, you'll want to include medically fragile PDN directory update. The email option is only available to current Medicaid enrolled providers. The second option is to mail the forms to the email address, address listed here. Forms must be mailed if submitted during the initial Medicaid provider enrollment process. However, this, process, this method is also available to currently enrolled Medicaid providers. The third option is to fax the forms to the number listed here. The cover sheet must include medically fragile PDN directory update and the name and contact number of the sender for questions. Again, the fax is only available to Medicaid enrolled providers. When you're filling out the forms, there will be two sections. The first section is for the certification of the nurse training and experience. This form no longer requires providers to list their training and experience. However, documentation to support training and experience must be kept by the independent nurse or agency and presented to the department upon request. Section two of the enrollment form for the Medically Fragile Children's Program is for the private duty nursing provider directory. If you are interested in enrolling in the directory, you would complete that portion. And then once you are enrolled in the directory, you would expect to receive contacts from members, family members, caregivers, discharge planners, case managers, or any other persons who would be assisting the member to locate a private duty nurse for the medically fragile children population. Okay, I am going to turn it over to Joanne Dion at this point, and she's going to, to go over some um, information that will be helpful when submitting those forms. I'm going to start just to, to go over this part of the slide. Uh, uh, again, as Melissa said, we did um, uh, have um, start accepting enrollments back on September 9th, um, the day that we had the uh, first webinar. Um, and so far, um, we have received uh, almost 50 submissions um, for participation in the directory since then. Um, so um, we thank all of you that have, that have applied, and uh, we hope to generate uh, a whole uh, bunch more from this one. And we also have some communications going out through the listserv to, and other forms uh, to, to help people enroll. Um, so Joanne had contacted us, and some of the things that they were finding um, in the forms um, that they thought would be just good reminders for you to check when you're um, when when you're filling these out. Um, please, um, uh, legible legibility do, does count because if they can't read it, um, they, they have a hard time figuring out who is supposed to be enrolled. Um, so um, uh, if you could just make sure you, you print nicely, um, except for the signature, um, and help them read the form when they are um, 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 reviewing these. Also, that you are required to sign the form, um, either a representative of the agency, uh, if an agency is applying, or the independent nurse themselves needs to sign the form. If it's not signed, that will delay um, the uh, processing of your application. Um, Joanne, did I see you get, uh, get uh, hooked up? I actually uh, had them call in. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I had originally called in. I had them call me instead. Okay. So I went through uh, the eligibility and the signatures. you want to pick it up at incomplete forms? Sure, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, we are finding that the forms are incomplete, and there's a couple explanations to that. One, the form's cut off. We can't see the revision dates or the form numbers at the bottom or part of the top of the form is cut off. So please just be sure um, when you're sending it that you're sending in the complete form. We're also finding that 
Unfortunately, the nurses are filling out the nurse registry form and vice versa. So the nurse registries are filling out the nurse form. You, if you're an independent nurse, you have to fill out the correct form. Um, so we're finding that we have to return for that as well. Um, incomplete, we've noticed quite a few where the phone number and the email address are not on there. They are mandatory, so we have to return for that. Uh, zip files, we are not allowed to open up this zip files. Anything that requires a password, we cannot open, so you're going to have to either send it by fax. Our fax is secure, just to let everyone know. It's not a fax machine that we're set, you're sending it to. It's actually coming through a secure email, even though it's a fax machine on your end. Uh, not listing the phone numbers or email address on the cover sheet, the fax cover sheet as well. If you don't list your phone number or email, we actually just added, you'll see it later on today, we added the email address for the contact person. If we can't read your phone number or your email address, we have no way to reach out to you to help you get the form completed correctly. Um, in regards to sending a picture of the form, we discussed this yesterday and we do see that some nurses are sending a picture. So in other words, they're filling out the application, original signature, signing it and dating it, and then they're taking a physical copy of it. If that is your only option, that is okay. However, you have to make sure that you have the entire form shown in the picture. So in other words, if the revision date's cut off, if anything else is cut off, um, we cannot accept it, so we will return it to you as well. And there's only one other thing that I wanted to mention. On the signatures, please make sure you're listing your first or your first and last name above your signature. When we see these, we're not seeing the names. And if it looks to appear like a different signature that we've received from the same agency, we're going to question it and we're going to send it back to you. Um, so that's everything that we have so far that we've seen. Um, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate uh, to email us and let us know. And you can ask at the end of this as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Joanne. Um, so, yep. um, so, yeah, so now um, instead of going through these slides that we went through the last time, we found that it was helpful to actually walk you through the eMedi screens. So um, uh, if uh, um, Neil, if you could just turn it over to eMedi, and we're going to just walk everybody through the enrollment process um, as you will see it on, on the on the eMedi screen. So just give us a a, a moment here. While wow, Neil is changing screens here. Oh, there we go. Great. There we go. You should see it on the okay. screen now, Tom. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. So uh, this is this is what it looks like. Uh, eMedi may all be familiar with this. And if you notice, you have a, you have your right underneath the eMedni, you have your tab. So the first place you want to go to is the provider enrollment tab, and you're going to hover over that, and you have a a, a um, choice there called provider index. So you're going to go and click on provider index, and these will mirror the slides in the um, the, 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 the the display. And if you just scroll down a little bit. Um, uh, you'll see on the right-hand side there's a huge list of providers, and you got to get down into the R's. Yep, there you go. And you see there's one for nurse registry and for nurse LPNs. So let's click into the nurse registry this time. We'll, we'll, we'll go back and go through the other one, too. They're basically the same. So here you come to the nurse registry for, um, uh, provider enrollment page. And if you scroll down a little bit more, Neil, uh, you'll see we have general instructions. You have requirements and additional forms. Uh, so you want to toggle on that carrot and open that up, and voila, you'll see private nursing program for medical children, fragile children form. So let's click in on that, and that will bring you to the enrollment form. And as you can see, there's a page of instructions where we talk about the um, program and and uh, and uh, you know the the law behind it and and whatnot and 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 some more I instructions about billing and whatnot and um, the second page there's two pages of instructions so actually the third page is going to actually be the form so um, and as uh, Melissa said on this form that there's two sections the first section is for certification of training and experience which is already in place um, if you're already enrolled in that you 
as Melissa said, you do not have to fill that part out, that way you're still enrolled, you don't have to re-enroll in that. Um, but if you go to the second page of the actual form, here it is, Section 2, Private Duty Nursing Directory. Um, so this is the agency. Um, you would check that you're, you're applying for this. Fill in all the information, the agency's name, license number, uh, your provider identification number. If you have one for new, new providers, you may not have this yet. Um, your NPI. And these two required fields, your contact email address and your contact phone number. Um, as Joanne said, it, it, these are very important, and if you don't put those in there, they will send the form back to you. We need to have a way that the um, uh, members and their caregivers will be able to, to contact you. We scroll down a little bit more. Here is where we say um, the agency representative's name, their title, and the agency signature. So that's a quick um, go-through of the form. Uh, now, I think if you go back to the first, to the, to, to, to the to, we'll walk us through one more time for the um, for the nurses, the independent nurses. Again, provider enrollment, provider index, and for independent nurses, you're going to select LPN RN. Yep, and there it takes you to the nurse enrollment. And again, similar pages. The, the, they're very structured, very similarly. If you scroll down a little further, you'll see the um, requirements additional forms, open that carrot, it opens the box, and there's the form that you need there. If you just click on that, they um, look very similar, um, except that this is, um, if you scroll down to the, the um, part where you can fill out the section, it says nurses, independent nurses. So again, it is the same form for either um, uh, um, the same type of form, just one that says independent nurses and one that says nurse registry. So you have to make sure that you pick the appropriate form for the type of enrollment um, that you have. Okay, so if we can go back to the presentation then. Um, yep, yeah, and this is a very, a very important slide. We'll leave this one up here. Uh, we won't actually go to the next one. We'll just leave this one here because this has a lot of information. Um, on it, um, um, again, uh, for questions about provider enrollment, um, you can go to emedney.org. There, there are two links that if you need to go to the provider enrollment, these links will take you to the nurse registry page, to the requirements and additional forms page, um, because when we, we did this slide, we did not have the forms approved uh, yet. Um, fee for service questions and directory questions, um, uh, the 800 number for our Fee for Service Call Center uh, for prior approval questions, our OHIP Med PA email box for any policy or, or um, um, PA questions, and our new email for directory questions, uh, PDN directory at health.ny.gov. Um, you can send any of your inquiries to there, um, and we will get back to you. Um, and also a link to our nursing provider, private nursing provider manual. But I think we'll leave this one up instead of going to the question and answer slide because I know this is a lot of information and, and people like to copy this down. Um, um, and thanks to uh, the GEDA uh, staff, Neil and everyone, for putting this together and helping us with this today. They've been great partners through this. I've been looking at some of the questions that have been coming in, and we answered a couple already. You guys uh, have, have already. Uh, been uh, uh, asking questions about things along the way, which is great. Uh, Beth and uh, Melissa will be fielding the questions. Uh, we are going to pick questions that we feel will be the most um, beneficial to all people in the webinar. Um, if you have a specific question about a PA um, or your specific situation, uh, we would be more than happy to, to work with you through that if you call us at um, the the the, the uh, one eight hundred number there for prior approval, or if you contact us, we will hit Med PA. Um, so we won't be discussing specific situations, but we'll be discussing and and taking questions that are uh, relevant to to the group in general. Um, so 
the first question we'll do is, um, if this is a good one, um, will the age limit limit continue to go up since generally those that are medically fragile tend to need more and more care as they age? Um, I'll, I'll field that one. Um, at, at this point, we, we raise the age limit um, um, to match the, for the training and experience portion to match the directory. Um, so um, that we didn't have one cutting out at 21 and one cutting out at 23. So uh, at this point, there are no plans to continually raise this, but um, we um, certainly are. Uh, will take that into consideration as we start um, looking at the program. You know, in a couple of years, as um, as, as it, it evolves and and matures. Uh, and listen, can you discuss how these changes will impact MTOs since the MFC waiver has been carved into managed care? Um, so I'll also answer that one. Um, th this is strictly for fee for service. It has no impact on on the MPOs, uh, the MCOs, um, and and their fees. Um, so they are required to um, provide the same level of services that Medicaid fee for service does. So. So they will be still required to to um, to provide private duty nursing, um, but it does not have any direct impact on NCOs um, or the MCF waiver that has been carved into managed care. Okay, um, we'll let um, uh, Melissa uh, take the next one. Um, if you add your name to the directory, but are currently working for an adult client, will the enhanced rate still apply to the provider? So you will receive the enhancement for the directory um, for if you are enrolled in the directory and caring for a member up to the age of 23. So you have to have both components. You have to have signed up to be in the directory, and the claim that you're submitting um, for your services has to be under 23 in order to get that enhancement. Uh, okay, um, there is a question. Uh, can you tell us how this was passed, linked to the laws, who passed it, et cetera? Um, uh, if you send us an email, we can provide you with, with that information. It was a, uh, uh, a budget bill. It was passed in the state budget back in uh, uh, early April when that was passed. Um, it is a Medicaid redesign uh, team uh, initiative. Um, so um, it's working through that process, um, but it was um, um, passed by the legislature into law, and um, we did promulgate uh, uh, um, regulation um, um, to enact it on a regulatory level. Um, the comment period for that has closed, and we are assessing public comment at this time, and we'll be um, then deciding on proceeding with adoption of the regulation. Okay, so uh, the next question we'll have Beth answer. Is the 50% increase on the base rate or fee, or is it 50% on the base rate or fee plus 30%? So Beth, why don't, why don't you feel that one? Sure. Um, the way that it's applied to the base fee depends on whether or not the provider is enrolled in one or both of the components. If you are enrolled in the Medically Fragile Enhancement currently, that's the 30% enhancement. That is applied first. So that would be applied to the base fee, uh, either the upstate or downstate. Uh, those are the new fees that will be in place. Once that 30% is applied, if you do not participate in the directory, that's what your fee will be. That's what you will be reimbursed. If you've also um, decided to enroll in the directory and you already have the training and experience, then from that 30% enhancement of the base fee, the 15% will be applied. And that 15% is in effect as of October 1st, 2020. However, April 1st of 2021, that second fee for being in the directory will increase to 30%. And then April 1st of 2022, it's going to increase to 45%. The training and experience is 
at this time not going to increase or change. So that would be the 30%, and that's staying the same. Great. Th thank you, uh, Beth. Um, we have another question. Can you give us the fax number again? Um, so the fax number to to um, submit your forms is 518-473-7251. And it's very important that you put on that cover sheet, Medically Fragile PDN Directory Update, and put a name and contact number of uh, someone on the cover sheet so that if there are any questions, the provider enrollment staff will be able to get back to you. If you don't do that, it will delay your, um, your uh, enrollment into the directory. Okay. Um, is this an actual raise for PDN or only if you are caring for medically fragile PED cases? Um, I, I'll, I'll answer that one. Um, uh, the regional rates will provide um, a slight increase to all providers, uh, some, some providers, most providers. What the regional rates have done is they've evened out all the county rates. So there are um, in counties where the rates were lower than others, um, we've raised them to try to be um, equal throughout that region, uh, downstate and upstate. So um, some counties are going to see uh, a, a, an increase for all um, cases, uh, a, a small increase um, um, to even things out, uh, but not everyone. Um, the 15% is only for members under the age of 23, um, uh, 15, 30, and 45. So, so the, 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 the larger increases will only be uh, uh, for uh, treating, uh, for caring for members under the age of 23. Okay, um, uh, Melissa, we'll let you um, answer this one. Um, how do I know which form to fill out? Okay, so as Tom just showed us a few moments ago, uh, you will go on to eMedney.org. You will go to the provider enrollment forms. You will need to choose either um, nurse registry if you are an agency or the um, nurse RN or LPN if you are an independently enrolled registered nurse or LPN. Um, and you would go down to the, Tom, was it the maintenance forms um, section? Yeah, hang on. I'm, I'm, uh, it's, uh, requirements. It's, requirements and additional forms. It's actually, and from it's, actually, manual, it's actually on the resource slide. I just forgot about it. Okay. Under okay. requirements. And then, go ahead, Mandel, I'm sorry. No, that's, that's fine. Um, and then you would just click on that link and you would be able to choose whether you are um, completing section one, section two, or both sections, and then submitting it um, one of those three ways to provide your enrollment. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, well, we still have the 1% deduction coming out of our claims. Um, uh, I'm sure there's many more of these questions in there. Um, this has no effect on the 1% um, across the board deduction. Um, PDN services will still be um, subject to, to that deduction as are uh, most other Medicaid services. Um, uh, Melissa, we'll, we'll let you do this one. Is this the same process for the adult population? So, the, so to enroll in the Medically Fragile Children's Program, that is, um, you can enroll for that, but it is for members who are up to the age of 23. Um, so if you're caring for an adult um, or a member, 23 or over, they would not be eligible, or you would not be eligible on those cases to receive the directory enhancement or the training and experience enhancement. You can enroll. Um, and then you would expect to receive inquiries. Um, and and uh, again, if you chose to accept one of those cases for a member under the age of 23, that's when you would get the um, directory enhancement or the training and experience uh, enhancement added on to your base fee. Yeah. Um, 
The next question, does the enhancement pay schedule continue after the three-year mark? Uh, the, the MRT and the budget initiative is funded up until that time. Um, we anticipate that after that time, the funding will continue. Um, uh, how, however, um, it, it is not in the budget at this point. Um, so we're working through the first three years, uh, and then as we're as the, again as the program matures and changes, we'll be um, um, looking to continue this. Um, that there is no indicate there's no indication that it will uh, that the money will not be continued after the three years at this point. Okay. Uh, Beth, what we'll give you the next one. How often will we need to update and revalidate this form for the directory? The revalidation process is um, every five years, and that's when you would have to um, revalidate and re uh, fill out that form again and send it in. Right. Thanks. Uh, um, like what? Uh, what we have a question. What is the new fee schedule for RNs in Upstate New York? Um, again, as Beth uh, said during the presentation, we we have hoped to have these um, rates available. Um, they are still uh, working through the budget approval process, and as soon as we um, can share those with the provider community, we will. Um, 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 again, uh, that'll go out on the email website, and there will be a list served um, for that. Um, if we continue to submit claims prior to 10-22, do we know when they will send the corrected difference? Um, I'll, I'll answer that. At this point, um, we uh, will be working as quickly as we can to, to get that uh, additional monies paid. Um, I, again, we do have to do some manual processing here and send things through a, a special process in the system to have the claims repriced. Um, we, we're not providing a time frame on that at this point, but we're hoping that it should be soon after uh, October 22nd. Um, we can't actually do the processing until after October 22nd. Okay. Um, we, we've been having a few enrollment questions. Um, um, Joanne, maybe you can answer this one uh, if you're still uh, uh, around. Um, will the enrollment into directory be confirmed by email? Uh, Tom, actually, we just discussed this offline, me and Pre. And what we can do is, we're not to do it every day, but maybe every Friday, since we're keeping a running list of the email addresses and the phone numbers for when you know the health data gets updated later on if that's an option, we could actually send out like a BCC to everyone so that they're all getting it at once and nobody's getting anyone's email address to let them know that you have um, successfully enrolled in the directory. If that's a solution that you guys are agreeable to, I think that would be fine. Okay. So that would be for people who are submitting directly. If you're submitting it on paper through uh, CSRA, um, would, would that still um, um, uh, Gita, would that still apply? Uh, yes, because we would still have to do those. They would just come over a few weeks later, so we could definitely still send them an email. Absolutely. Okay, so we'll, 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 it looks like we'll be able to do that. That's hot off the presses. Um, you guys are in the yes. know first. So. Thank you, Joanne. You're welcome. Okay, um, Beth, we'll have, have you answer this one. If we are currently caring for a medically fragile patient, does the enhanced fee schedule apply to our current patient? Um, would you read that to me again, please? If we're currently caring for a medically fragile patient, does the enhanced fee schedule apply to our current patient? Yes, if you are enrolled, you need to be enrolled in the program to receive the enhancement uh, for either of the components. Um, and that enhancement, if you're enrolled in the training and experience, is the 30% for medically fragile. And then the additional enhancement for the provider directory, uh, the 15, 30, or 45%, depending on you know, what 
time period we're in. Um, but you need to enroll in those programs. If you're not enrolled, you will not get the enhancements. And it will go up to the age of 23. Um, I don't think that email or that question specifically uh, told me what age that person was. So up to the age of 23. Okay, that's why I let you answer this one too. Um, I stopped claiming the fee for medically fragile patients when my patient turned 21. She is now 22. Can I resume claiming for the 30% from October 1st? Yes. Um, there is no backdating of the enhancement, um, but as of October um, 1st, 2020, if you are uh, currently enrolled in the enhancement um, of the 30%, then you would you would start to receive that enhancement um, if that's on your file that you um, have submitted the training and um, experience attestation. And if you'd like the additional, you need to enroll in the provider directory as well. Uh, I, I, I saw uh, as an LPN already taking care of a medically fragile child, to enroll in the directory, the first page of independent provider states, is this a new enrollment or a revalidation? Do we fill this part out? Um, yeah, I, I think you can, that uh, in this instance, we are going to, uh, you, you can leave that blank or put it as a new enrollment um, because everybody's a new enrollment into this, this um, program. The most important thing is, is that you give us your MMIS number so that we know you are already in the system so that we can find you um, and, and hook you up with the directory. Okay. Uh, since the Department of Health is taking over setting the fees, does this mean my base pay right now could be lowered? Um, uh, I will field that one. Um, no, um, as of uh, the setting of the regional fees, we have um, not lowered anyone's um, um, base, base rate. The, the, the rates we, we uh, have looked at to normalize everything um, did not result in lower fees for, for any, anyone in, in, in the county. Um, um, that's um, the Ontario County, uh, that, that's part of what the grandfathering is all about. Um, people who are currently um, taking uh, care of members who are located in Ontario County will maintain their fees, uh, but um, new cases will go in at the regional fee, um, which may be different than what the current Ontario County fee is. But in general, the, the, the working of the regional rate fees, regional fees, was to even out the disparity between counties so that if you're Neighboring county um, gets, doesn't get five dollars more than than you're getting um, um, for the same services. So, so that's kind of what what this is meant to to do. Okay, um, Beth, we'll have you answer this one. PDN services PDNs receive thirty percent enhanced rate now. That will remain at thirty percent. That's the training experience. Uh, and increase by 15% or will be at 15% 10-1 and increase to 15, and increase 15% more on 421. Um, I, I think if you go over the structure again, that, that might clear up any confusion, Beth. Sure. So the way that the um, private duty nursing directory, uh, that enhancement is going to increase incrementally. So. If you enroll and you're enrolled for October 1st, 2020, you will receive the 15%. So you're going to continue to be enrolled as of April 1st, 2021. That amount will automatically increase to 30% because you are enrolled in the directory. And as if you're a new uh, provider and you enroll effective April 1st, you will also get the 30%. Um, as of April 1st, 2022, everyone enrolled in the directory, that amount will go up to 45%. Great. Um, okay, Melissa, uh, the next question. 
Uh, will the new PA be automatically generated if the current PA is in place and uh, in place and runs past 10.1, or do we need to apply for a new PA? So the Department of Health prior approval unit will be issuing uh, those prior approvals. So if you have a prior approval that's currently approved and it ends after 10-1, what we are going to do is we are going to take that prior approval, give it an end date of 9-30-2020, and we will uh, put a new prior approval in place with a start date of 10-1. It will have the same end date uh, as the current prior approval, so you will not need to submit a prior approval um, for that portion. You'll just have to do your renewals in the future. But Department of Health will take care of, of putting those in place so that we can apply the new regional fees. Okay. Uh, how can we check to see if we are on the directory? Um, uh, Joanne, is that, a, is that a question they should send to, to GDIT? Or, or I mean, I mean how, how should people check to make sure, um, other than you, you will be sending emails out for everyone who's applied on a Friday. Uh, hello, Tom. Uh, I would say the best thing to do is definitely wait till the Friday of whatever week you submitted the form. And if you still do not get a response, it might be one that we've returned or we can't return because something's illegible. I would say then and only then call CSRA because we don't want to um, cause mass phone calls because then they're not going to be able to do what they need to do um, in regards to getting all these forms imaged. So I would say wait till the Friday of the same week that you submit it. And then if you do not receive an email, then and only then reach out to CSRA. Great. Thank but you. But we will Enjoy. send an email. Sure. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, okay. How do we verify we indeed contacted potential clients who called for services since it is mandatory to return calls or emails? So um, I'll answer that. Um, so we're at this point, um, we are um, counting on you um, uh, as professionals to, to abide by the rules and, and to return the calls. Um, um, there really is not a verification process. What will happen is if we get complaints or we get um, information from members or someone that says, I contacted so-and-so and they did not call me back, um, the department may reach out to you and, and say, hey, you know, um, did you do this? Um, um, you know, if you have some kind of, keep some kind of notes that, you, you know, date and time that you called somebody um, or a call log or, or, or an email or, or, or whatever, that would be helpful, but, but we will reach out to you. Again, we're, we're just trying to make sure that, that everybody who contacts the directory people do get a, a yes or no answer, um, um, and um, we will be working uh, as the program matures on how this will be incorporated into um, 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 our processes. Okay, we got a, um, uh, from St. Mary's Health System, which is a, a comment, thank you for, uh, uh, we greatly appreciate the DOH's consideration for the increased fees and the directory for the medical fragile population. So thank you, St. Mary's Health System. Is this a grant or is Medicaid paying for the enhancement? Um, this is not a grant. Um, this is budgetary funds. Funds have been allotted into the Medicaid budget specifically for this uh, MRT, Medicaid Redesign Team enhancement. So uh, at this point, there are budgetary funds um, for the three-year period. Um, just scrolling through, a lot of these questions that we have are repeats of what we've already answered. Um, okay, here's one from Melissa. Do nurses working for registries have to enroll in the medically fragile directory? So if you're working for an, an agency, um, the agency would be filling out that form. If you um, also work separately as an independent nurse, then you would have to fill those forms out. But if you strictly work for a nursing agency, the nursing agency representative would be filling those forms out and signing those forms and attesting to the fact um, that the providers are either um, have the training and experience or will be um, available in the directory. So it is the agency. 
Thank you, Melissa. Uh, uh, this question, well, we still need to put the, the number seven, which is an SA exception code, on e-paces um, since we have to do that currently for the 30% enhancement. Uh, yes, at this time, the instructions for billing the enhancement, um, for getting the 30% enhancement uh, for training experience still required the, the SA code uh, number seven when you submit claims during e-paces. Uh, the directory does not require that SA code um, that is processed in a different manner. Um, but yes, you still need to put the, the SA code 7 on your claim if you want the, the enhancement of the 30%. Uh, earlier in the presentation, it was noted two PAs are required. Does this apply to MCOs as well? Uh, no, uh, I'll answer that. No, MCOs are not included in this, so um, whatever um, PAs or um, um, billing rules you have for the MCOs, they remain the same. These do not apply. Um, what oversight can we can as PDN expect by enrolling in the directory? Uh, again, I think we, we just touched on that. Um, we, we are not um, uh, um, at this point um, monitoring um, the, the directory participation as an oversight. Um, again, uh, if we receive inquiries or, or complaints from members, caregivers, um, or case managers that says that, that tell us that people are not um, answering the phones or, or sending emails back or to inquiries, we will contact you to discuss the situation. Um, so, um, you know, again, we're we're looking at um, uh, at uh, you as professionals to be able to to make sure that everybody gets an answer. Um, a lot of questions about when the rates will be posted. As soon as we can, we will post those. Um, uh, I mixed the fax number. Can you give it again? Uh, the fax number for form submission is 518-473-7000. Again, um, make sure you put a contact number and name on that and make sure the cover sheet is identified as medically fragile PDN directory update. Where can a participating, where can a directory for participating agencies and nurses be found? So um, we did show a slide, a mock-up of the directory. Um, uh, um, there is a website on there. It is not, and it's not functional right now. Um, but in the very near future, it, it, we will be able to, to put that up there, and that's where the directory will be found. Um, a little bit about the directory, there will be an interactive map where uh, people can click on uh, the county, and um, it will bring up all the uh, participating nurses that, that are uh, in the medically fragile directory uh, for children in that county. Um, as I said in the slide, you can sort by zip code and uh, some other uh, parameters. Um, so uh, as soon as that, we're aiming to have that go live right around October uh, 1st, um, so the directory will be out there. Um, um, but there, there is another directory that we will be providing some, uh, um, not so much a directory, but another listing uh, in Health and Data in New York, um, where you can look for all nurses, you can look for all providers on there. There's a data set on there for all, um, um, all the the, 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 peop the the people who provide services in Medicaid. Uh, but we will be issuing some instructions on how to navigate that data set, so that if you want to look for all nurses enrolled in the program, not just one in the PDN directory for medically fragile children. If you're looking for someone who may want to, who may be uh, needed for an adult case, and and, and whatnot, so there will be that on Health Data New York. As soon as those instructions are available, um, you can actually email us at the, the PDN directory, and we can email those to you once, once we've uh, vetted them and, and they are finished. Um, but that will be on the Health Data New York site. Um, I just answered that. Where will the directory be online? When will be on where? Um, uh, uh, I, the enhanced rate of pay is only for the directory if I am considered high tech LPN and care for a medically fragile child. I've completed training and pursued further training 
There is no increase to the base pay for upstate nurses. Um, again, as Beth explained, um, there, uh, the, we, we are going to regional rates, um, and we are also going to have the, the training experience. Plus, if you enroll in the directory, you'll get the extra uh, incentive for um, caring for a member under the age of 23. So um, uh, I'm unsure what you're, what, we're, what you're trying to ask there. If, if that did not answer your question, please let us know. Okay, um, uh, Beth, um, we will um, have you answer this. If we're already enrolled as a medically fragile provider, is there a need to re-enroll? Will it be the same code number? No, you don't need to re-enroll. If you've, you're already enrolled um, in the medically fragile training experience enhancement, that will continue. You'd have to re-enroll when you do your revalidation every five years. However, if you want to become part of the directory as well, you must enroll in that separately. Okay, um, uh, Melissa, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, um, uh, this is kind of in general, um, if my prior approval is due by in November, should I wait until after October 1st to submit it or should I submit it now? Um, you can you can do either. Um, if it is submitted and reviewed prior to 10-1, um, you may end up having, um, well, you'll just have one prior approval because it will go into effect in November. Um, and once we have those regional fees, we'll be able to apply them. Um, if we have not yet um, received those regional fees, we would have to um, apply them once, once they have been approved to that prior approval that starts in November. Okay. Um, if my patient, Melissa will give this one to you also, if my patient has a PA valid in February 2021, will we, will we be receiving a new PA and when? Um, yep, so if you have a current prior approval that's ending in February of 2021, the prior approval office will be end dating um, your current prior approval with an end date of 930. We will be generating a new prior approval with a start date of 101, and we will be doing that once we have received those approved regional fees. Um, so as soon as we have that information, we will be able to um, set up those new prior approvals. Okay, thank you. Uh, someone's asking if I, I missed the September 9th training. Is there another session I could attend? Um, well, if you are if you attended this session here, it, it is the same session that was from the 9th. So we, we, we were just presenting it at two separate times to uh, get as many people as possible um, to, to, to attend. Um, again, just uh, it, so if we're enrolled to care for medically fragile children, we get the 30% enhancement of our base fees. And uh, once we enroll in the directory, the 15% enhancement will begin October 1st. We add it on to that amount. Is that correct? Yes, that is that is that is correct. Now, someone's asking. I sent my form by me email on 99 for the directory. Should I call for a status update? Um, as, as Joanne said, um, we, we will be sending out uh, emails. Um, every, uh, you know, they're going to start them Fridays. I would wait until next week because they haven't sent any out yet, so they'll send a bunch out um, hopefully this Friday. Um, but you, you could, I would wait and call for an update next week. When we bill for services, how or where do we indicate that the provider directory should be applied? Um, so I'll answer that one. I, I, as I said earlier, um, there is no indicator you need for that. Um, we've programmed it so that the directory enhancement will be implied based on your enrollment on the provider file. So as long as you've enrolled in the directory um, and have the proper indicator on your file, you should see the enhancement on uh, the claim. It's, it's a little different than the medically fragile uh, training and experience where you still have to put the uh, service authorization exception code seven. Uh, can the Department of Instrument of Verification for members emailing agencies as we tend to avoid external emails not recognized? Um, we are not uh, um, able to do that. 
um, your agency will have to figure out um, how they're going to um, accept these emails that may come in um, from uh, other other people um, and, and act on them appropriately. Um, um, at this point, uh, emails are not going to be on the directory. We, we are collecting them to update them. We anticipate in the next phase, again, as it's as this process matures, they will be available. So most of your um, uh, contact initially will be by telephone. Uh, do we have to do the math for the increased rates ourselves, or there can be a chart put up on eMedney broken down by regions and rates to keep it simpler? Um, uh, I, 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 I'm uncertain what you mean by that. Um, um, we will be redoing the PAs for after October 1st for any rates that, that may have changed um, so that it will do it automatically. Um, there's really no um, uh, intervention you need to do on claims processing for that. But if you want to clarify that, we can, we can revisit that question. Again, when aware with a website slides be placed up for public view, um, they will be on the MEDNI as, as, um, in, in the near future. Um, we're also most likely going to put them on the uh, Medley Fragile Directory site, too. Um, the signature on forms, I'm private duty. Do I sign as the agency? Um, you may be in the wrong form. You want the form that says independent nurses. If you're an independent private duty nurse, um, the agency form is if you um, are working for an agency. Um, and if that's the case, the agency representative needs to fill out that form. Okay, um, Beth, we'll have you answer this one. Um, must you apply again if you're already enrolled in the Medically Fragile program um, for training and enhancement? I'm not talking about the directory, just training and enhancement. No, that program is not changing, or uh, that component of this program isn't changing. You will continue to receive the 30% enhancement because you are currently enrolled in that. Um, you need to revalidate every five years, and that's when you would have to resubmit that paperwork. Great. Uh, Beth, we'll, we'll have you answer this one. Uh, is the 50% increase for the directory calculated on the base fee, or is it calculated after the 30% medically fragile training experience is added? That depends on whether you're signed up for both components. Uh, I believe most people are signed up uh, for the medically fragile training and experience. If so, that 30% is um, applied first to the base fee. If you are only in the provider directory, the 15% is applied to the base fee. If you're in both components, then the 30% is applied for the training experience first, and then the additional 15% uh, October 1, which will go up to 30% April 1, um, will be applied, and 45% for April 1 of 2022. Yeah. Okay. Who did you say sets the regional fees now instead of the counties? Um, so the Department of Health, uh, with the new, with the change in the law, will now be the entity that sets the fees for private duty nursing. Um, the fees will no longer be based on the counties, and the, and the counties would not be um, in, involved in that in that um, determination. So it is the Department of Health um, that will be doing the fee the fee setting. Um, will there be another webinar regarding adult population or at least uh, a directory compiled of PDNs? Uh, there has been a lot of um, um, questions about the adult population through here. I, I have not, um, we have not answered them, um, mainly because this initiative is only targeted at medically fragile children. Um, um, at, at this point in time, um, that, that was what was chosen as the enhancement. Um, so we wouldn't be able to do a webinar on the adult population. Um, a directory of compiled PD, PDNs, uh, again, I, I did say that um, we will be issuing some um, uh, instructions on how to pull out a list of all private duty nursing uh, nurses out of the Health Data New York site. 
um, this will uh, allow um, you to find not just only directory nurses, which will be found in the directory that, that are certified for medically fragile children, but it also will find people who are all private duty nurses who are enrolled in the program that um, may be accepting adult cases. Okay. Um, um, the percentage increases are 15, 30, and 45. The later increases are on top of the previous increase. Um, no, the increase changes every uh, on the fee on that schedule. So that April, uh, October 1st, it's 15 percent. Uh, April um, 1st, 21, the 15 changes to 30 percent, and then on April 1st, 22, the 30 percent changes to 45 percent. So it's not it's not that they don't stack in the way you're trying to stack them, they will change. They will go from 15, they will, and then it changes to 30, and it changes to 45. Um, again, there are a lot of questions about the base rates, what the rates are, how are they determined, um, that sort of thing. Um, um, you know, we, we, we did um, make it so that we tried to even out from all the counties that, that the surrounding counties are not getting, you know, different rates and, and, and things. Um, I, until I, we can publish the, the rates, there's not much more we can say about them, uh, the fees and we can say about them. So as, uh, as soon as we have the approval, um, we will post them um, possible, uh, uh, post them. Um, when will you have another session? Um, we have no more sessions scheduled. Um, but if um, there is enough of an interest, um, we, we could possibly schedule another session. But, but at this point, we, we um, do not have another session scheduled. There will be some communications going out, too, that give a lot of the same information that is in this presentation. Okay, where do I find the page to sign the training and experience attestation? That is section one of the form. Um, that's for training and experience, the 30 percent. Um, the form that we showed you has Section 1 and Section 2. Section 2 is the new directory. Section 1 is the um, training and experience. Okay, Beth, well, I'll let you answer this one. If we don't sign up for the directory, do we lose our present 30 percent enhancement? No, those are two separate components of the program. Uh, you will continue to get your 30% enhancement if you have signed up for the um, medically fragile training and experience. So that will continue as is. That's not going to change. I get a lot of questions about the rates um, that and uh, uh, regions. Again, as soon as we have any information, we will we will provide that to you. Okay, um, uh, uh, Melissa. So for the directory, we just fill out the appropriate form and send it in. No extra paperwork needed if we are already in the medically fragile uh, training enhancement. That's correct. If you're currently enrolled in the medically fragile training and experience and receiving the 30 percent, you just need to fill out section two of that form, which is for the directory, and submit it to a provider enrollment. Um, this is a good question. After the three years, Will we start over at 15, 30, 45, or do we anticipate it to continue at 45? Um, so after the three years, um, yes, we, uh, we, we uh, reached the, the 45 percent. Um, uh, again, that's the, the end of the current funding. We do anticipate the funding to be continued. We don't think it'll go back to 15 or 30. Um, um, we, 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 we would anticipate it would stay at that rate. Um, but again, it all depends on budget approval and, and budget at the time. But again, that's three years. Um, this program is, it will be maturing through the whole three years. Um, so we will uh, keep that in mind and, and look at that when we do um, this, this, um, this um, the, 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 the three years after our current period. So that is um, the end of the questions, and, and we are reaching near the end of time. Um, if there is any last questions that you want to ask, um, feel free to do that in the next minute or so. Um, we will be taking these questions and looking at them. Um, 
um, we um, have um, the questions from the first session. Um, and we'll, we'll be looking at all of them as an aggregate and, and talking about um, uh, um, some of the issues that have been mentioned in, in the question um, and in here and, and working through uh, some of the issues you've brought up, especially about um, enforcement has been a big, a big one that we've seen fly by. Again, I think a lot of the questions will be answered once the rates are, uh, the fees are announced. Um, the slide presentation will be available. We will post them as soon as possible. Um, and uh, someone just wrote in again, does the pay increase apply to managed care? No, it doesn't. This is fee for service only. Uh, managed care um, rates um, are up to, the fees are up to the managed, each individual managed care organization. Um, uh, Joanne, one last question. Is there a way to verify when revalidation is needed um, or will we just be notified when the time comes? So currently right now, revalidation has been suspended due to the COVID emergency. So the providers that were in the middle of the process or who received letters right before, they are safe in regards to revalidation. But the only way to find out if they haven't received anything up to this point is they would have to call CSRA to see what is on their file to find out when they're due for revalidation. Okay. Because once you. the COVID emergency, oh, you're welcome. Once the COVID emergency is over, we will resume, um, you know, revalidation procedures as we did before the emergency was started. Great. Okay, again, I, I just, uh, as, we, as we close out here, I just uh, point you back to um, um, the, the resources. Um, you know, if you have questions about PAs, uh, OHIP Med PA, our, our, our 800 number, the PDM directory at health.ny.gov, any questions that you may have there. We do have some guides. If you need a guide on how to find the, um, the forms on the uh, eMedney website, we do have one for nurses and one for agencies if, if you want to, to, to look at that. Um, uh, if you need some step-by-step, -step, if you can't, can't um, uh, navigate through that, um, the eMedney call center number um, and our manual. Um, so we will, um, um, we will continue to look at the questions and, and, and provide any other information we, we, we can based on what you submitted. So um, uh, I think... Um, we'll turn it back over to our host at, at GDIT um, uh, to close out today. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate that. And thank you all for participating in today's webinar. Uh, please make sure that you follow the instructions that were discussed during today's session. And also keep in mind that you can find the enrollment forms and additional information on the medney.org website. So thanks again, everyone, for joining, and we'll be ending today's session. Have a great day.